Welcome everyone. We will be getting started in a few minutes, which is way for people to trickle in, in okay? Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our Massachusetts Oral Health Equities Virtual Summit. Um, today would be our last to um, the second one, the second to the last one uh, in our weekly series. Uh, my name is On Bui. I'm the coordinator for um, Oral Health Equity Project at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And today I will be the moderator for our presentation on oral health equity. Uh, for this um, presentation. So um, to start, um, there's some of the um, key housekeeping items that I'd just like you to be aware of. Um, everyone would be muted, um, open entry to minimize the background noise. So if you have a thought or questions, uh, feel free to put in the chat box or a Q&A, uh, which you can find it on the bottom of the screen. And we go going to moderate on the questions in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, this, all this webinar will be equipped with the cards reporter. Um, so if you would like to see, um, feel free to hover on the CC icon at the bottom of the screen um, and click on show subtitles so that you can see that. Um, all these presentations are going to be recorded and going to be shared and posted on our Department of Oral Health Equity webpage. Um, for those who need um, CE, you will need to present uh, to be present here for the entire an hour and a half. And you also require to complete all the evaluation um, that will be emailed out once the presentations have ended. Um, so now before we jump into the presentation, I just have a quick poll um, just to see who um, is going to be with us today. Hold on, let me just pull the poll. You have a couple minutes to uh, fill it in, so just feel free to put it in. So we see, um, yeah, just a couple more seconds and I'm going to close the poll. Then see dental professional, health educator, community health worker, a lot of others here. So I'm going to end the polls here. So we have about 37% um, who are dental professional attending today, 13% um, who are community workers and uh, many others, as well as health educator and school nurses too. So welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to introduce our next presenters today. So I would like to welcome the Rhode Island Oral Health Team, um, Sadie Dakuchi, Jordi Lerman, and Dr. Sam uh, Zuckerman, um, and Jennifer um, Ritchie 
who's going to present on the Rhode Island approach to oral health equity. Sadie is the oral health um, program manager at Rhode Island Department of Health. Jody is the um, EPI, and Dr. Uh, Zekerbaum is the dental directors at the oral health program and also the dental directors of the state Medicaid program. So you can all now go ahead and please start it. Let me just start sharing the screen real quick here so that you can get on. All right, on. it looks like we are already up. Perfect. Okay, and can you, everyone, you can hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you, I'm gonna go with yes. Um, thanks, Ann, and um, hi to everyone. Um, I wanna thank you for joining us today, and thank you to the Massachusetts Office of Health Equity for hosting this great event. Before we dive in, I wanted to take a moment to recognize that now, more than ever, health equity is vital to the framework of our country. From COVID-19 affecting more minority populations and those in lower socioeconomic populations, to the recent murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, we all can play a role in advancing not only racial equity, but overall health equity. And it starts with learning from others and educating ourselves on where things stand and how we can do better. So I commend all of you for participating in the summit today, and I'm looking forward to learning together and sharing today with our Massachusetts counterpart. I did also, before we really dive into oral health discussions, I did want to provide you with some COVID-19 data that has recently come across my desk. Um, and I think it accurately depicts the racial inequities that exist in our healthcare system in Rhode Island and across the country. So those particular points are, there are 1,129 positive COVID-19 cases for every 100,000 Hispanic Rhode Islanders. There are 911 positive cases for every 100,000 Black Rhode Islanders. And there are only 220 cases for every 100,000 White Rhode Islanders. So I think that paints a good picture for us. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So we are the Rhode Island Department of Health Oral Health Program. My name is Sadie DeCourcy and I'm the Oral Health Program Manager. And today we'll be talking about how our program and department are approaching health equity in general and oral health equity in particular. I would also like to put Rhode Island in perspective for you all. We have a population of 1.1 million and at just 1,214 square miles, we are the smallest state, but second in the most densely populated. In comparison, Massachusetts is 10,565 square miles. So just a little bit bigger than us. Um, people often struggle with how to translate what we do in Rhode Island to a much larger state. And I say, think of us as a city or county in your state and how you might apply change there and then scale it up to the entirety of your state. What else about Rhode Island? Well, we were founded by Roger Williams, who you can see in the statue on the left-hand picture looking out over Providence. Roger Williams was actually cast out of Massachusetts in the 1600s for promoting religious freedom, separation of church and state, and the fair treatment of Native Americans. Rhode Island was founded in, in equality and hope, which is our motto, and it's what we strive to do here at the Rhode Island Department of Health every day. Next slide. And I should mention, I, I cannot leave out our love of going to the beach, just for a little levity in all of this. Um, and uh, the next slide, these are our objectives for the day. We want to first ground everyone in the data and where Rhode Island stands on oral health and barriers to care. And then we're going to dive into the work we are doing in our program and department to achieve oral health equity. Next slide. This is the mission and focus of the oral health program. An integral piece to our success is our third focus, collaboration. We know we can't do this alone and greatly rely on collaborations with various partners, including our Oral Health Commission, which is made up of passionate oral health advocates from across the state and is completely based on volunteers. We also work closely with our federally qualified health centers and hospital-based clinics to ensure vulnerable communities can achieve optimal oral health. Next slide. Our oral health team is small but mighty, much like our beloved Rhode Island, 
and we come from a, a variety of professional backgrounds, including work with Native American populations, investigations with the Rhode Island Department of Health Center for Acute and Infectious Disease Epidemiology, quality improvement and systems changes, and investing in our older adult population by founding a mobile dental clinic to work in nursing homes. I think you guys can probably guess who that is, our wonderful dental director. You will hear from all of us today, um, almost all of us today, Veronica is on the, the phone supporting us, um, and we'll be talking about our various work. Next slide. I wanted to be able to show you all where we sit within the department and who we get to work with on a daily basis. This is our overall makeup of the department. The Rhode Island Department of Health was actually restructured when we received our public health accreditation in 2015. Having oral health under the Division of Community Health and Equity allows us to create new partnerships and really think about how we can creatively spread oral health messaging. We are also lucky that there is only one Department of Health in the state. This allows us to have direct influence in the changes across the state and often allows us easier access to the people who run the other programs. It was nice, pre-COVID of course, to be able to walk over to someone's office to chat instead of relying on email. Next slide. Here you can see an even further breakdown of the Division of Community Health and Equity and all the opportunities we have for partnership. And I hope you all can sense a trend here. We are very pro partnership and uh, getting creative with those we work with. Some examples of these projects include working on HPV messaging with the immunization program, training family visitors, also known as home visitors, to speak to their families about oral health with the family visiting program, and creating a survey for dental providers around their knowledge of hypertension and diabetes and their role in prevention of those chronic diseases with the Integrated Chronic Disease Program. Next slide. Before I hand it off to our dental director, Sam Swetchenbaum, I wanted to show you the overarching goal and leading priorities of the Department of Health. In all our activities, addressing social determinants, eliminating disparities, and ensuring access to quality health services is at our core. For every presentation or discussion that involves the department, we use this slide to promote this goal and priorities. Now I'll pass it on to Sam. Okay, uh, oh. so, oops. So as Sadie mentioned, the Health Equity Institute was developed to promote collective action to achieve the full potential. Oh, start my video. I hope this is working. Oh, okay, sorry. As Sadie mentioned, the Health Equity Institute was developed to promote collective action to achieve the full potential of Rhode Islanders. Many of us have seen this image of the baseball game, which recognizes a difference between treating populations equally and treating populations equi equitably. We know we need to make our communities healthier, but understanding what are the challenges and what are the solutions required to achieve equity requires input of the community. The Health Equity Institute promotes education and the development of a movement called Health Equity Zones, or HESs, we call them, to address social, economic, and environmental conditions. The HESs are meant to go from talking to placing an infrastructure that puts the community's voice front and center. Communities bring together key stakeholders and develop a structure often based at a hospital or health center for action. So I'll talk a little bit about the health equity zones and how we've worked with them a little bit. Okay. Now I'm trying to advance my slide. Okay, so it is recognized that 50% of health is determined by social, economic, and environmental factors. So addressing these is important. So some examples, there's a school in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, we hope to do a virtual dental home project with. If that school has poor attendance, our project will fail. So fortunately, the school worked with the community 
to look at some of the issues around low attendance, and they developed something called the walking school bus, where parents and teachers walk by students' houses, and they all work to walk together uh, to school. Attendance has increased. In Newport, Rhode Island, they developed something called a grandmother's group to support grandmothers who are raising children. They recognized that was a need in their community. The Onlyville neighborhood of Providence developed walking paths and parks where farmers markets can take place in what was previously demolished factories and a food desert. So what does the Rhode, Rhode Island Department of Health support? Um, they pr provide funding through grants, technical assistance, eva and evaluation assist assistance. What must the HES Collaborative do? So the HES Collaborative gets together within the community to create a common agenda, share a measurement system that tracks indicators of success. They work together on mutually reinforcing activities. They engage in continuous communication and they identify a backbone organization that supports and facilitates the collaborative process at the local level. And I've had the opportunity to attend some of the meetings of the Pawtucket HES, and it's always an opportunity to make some connections and talk about our projects. I'm gonna show you now a video from a recent health equity summit where the HESs showed off their successes and shared some lessons learned. Zones are community-led collaboratives that are in a very specific geographic area making decisions about what health is, what health means to them, what's important to them, and how they want to address the issues that are important to them. And they go way beyond just health, traditional health issues, because folks are talking about the importance of jobs, the importance of education, uh, the importance of housing, all of those factors that at the end of the day are what determines our health. The thing that to me is really exciting about health equity zones is that the government doesn't have to decide to sitting in their state office buildings what needs to be invested in. You're bringing people together in neighborhoods, in communities. You're creating an infrastructure for them to tell us what the community needs for education, for transportation, uh, to address health needs. So when you have those bottom-up, grassroots-led initiatives, you can be sure that government's going to do smarter things. It's been a long time in West Woolwich since everybody was on the same page. And the Health Equity Zone has really helped to do that. They've brought a lot of these different groups together that compete for resources. The impact of the HES has been beyond quantifiable for us. You know, I don't know where we would be without that additional support. If you check the test scores at the end of the school year, if you check the attendance at the end of the school year, I guarantee you that out of the 20-something elementary schools in the city of Providence, we'll be in the top three. We would love to see this taken up by more communities. This is ground setting, and I think that people in Rhode Island should be very proud to have this kind of initiative going on. And people across the nation will pay attention, and a lot of what's going on in Rhode Island is going to get highlighted, and a lot of people are going to be looking here to see how to do that in their own communities. And as, as Sadie mentioned, um, COVID-19 and the disparities that we've noticed in Rhode Island, one of the first steps has been to go to the Hezes in the neighborhoods which like Central Falls and Pawtucket where have uh, with very high percentages and work within those communities to see what is needed in terms of testing and infrastructure to correct these disparities. Regarding oral health and Hezes, several examples. In Newport, there was an, uh, an anti-fluoridationist who actually had reached out to the HES to prime them with unsupported information to encourage discontinuation of fluoridation. We had already given some pre presentations to the grandmother's group and had provided information at a health fair, so we knew this was the group to come talk to. Yes, we did go to talk to the mayor of Newport, but more important was to talk to the HES and give them solid information about fluoridation and ask them to reach out to the mayor and city council. Sadie in a little bit will share information about some education that we did uh, in South County and how we partnered with the HES in the, that area. So while we have not yet had any oral health specific projects that have grown up from the HES, 
we have latched on to the community strength. The 500 Cities Project is a collaboration between the CDC, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the CDC Foundation. The purpose of the 500 Cities Project is to provide city and census tract level small area estimates for chronic disease risk factors, health outcomes, and clinical preventive service use for the largest 500 cities in the United States. These small area estimates will allow cities and local health departments to better understand the burden and geographic distribution of health-related variables in their jurisdictions and assist them in planning public health interventions. By neighborhood, the reports look at health outcomes such as blood pressure, diabetes, and tooth loss. They look at rates of unhealthy behaviors such as smoking and obesity, and finally at preventive measures such as physician visit and dental visits. I'd encourage you to visit the website about 500 cities. They talk about four cities in Rhode Island that are represented and 13 in Massachusetts. So this data is be pulled from uh, what we call BRFIS or the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is a phone survey, which includes oral health questions every, uh, every other year, including visit to the dentist and tooth loss. So if you look at Providence, which is on the lower left, adults on the east side of Providence, represented by, by number four, are nearly twice as likely to report a dental visit in the past year compared to those from Olneyville or West End neighborhoods. This might be helpful knowledge for us in targeting interventions with equity in mind. It indicates to us that there are disparities, so we might have to put in extra efforts to address the disparities in Olneyville and um, those neighborhoods. Similarly, these maps show rates of tooth loss among adults age 65 and older, and this knowledge by neighborhood can help identify disparities and target interventions. So the Whedon-Barton neighborhood in Pawtucket, which is on the upper right, has a rate of missing teeth between 27 and 32% among those over 65, compared again to the east side of Providence, where the rate is between three and 8%. So that demonstrates there's work to be done and I'll show you, we do, we are very fortunate to have, um, a, as, as Sadie said, we collaborate work with our federally qualified health centers, um, eight of them, which all have dental programs. So we were fortunate to see that Blackstone Valley put together a second health center with a dental clinic in Central Falls, Rhode Island, which is right near that Barton Weed neighborhood. And we, we look forward to collaborating with them. So um, knowing where disparities exist by neighborhood can help us target intervention. So I'll now turn it over to Jordan to review some of our uh, surveillance data. Hi, I'm Jordan. I'm the oral health epidemiologist and I'm gonna go through a little bit about our surveillance and highlight some data points. Um, so the National Oral Health Surveillance System, which is a collaborative effort between CDC, ASTDD, and CSTD, CSTE, is designed to monitor the burden of oral disease, use of the oral health care delivery system, and the status of community water fluoridation on both a national and state level. They have eight different indicators that are on adult, child, and water fluoridation. The VITO Oral Health Program utilizes the indicators created by NOHSS and Healthy People 2020, in addition to 22 different data sources to establish our 55 indicators under four different indicator groups. Some of the surveillance system and surveys that our program utilizes and implements are the basic screening survey for third graders, the Head Start basic screening survey, and the Senior Center basic screening survey. We also utilize YRBS, BRFSS, um, NHANES, and some others. Next slide. So through our Head Start Basic Screening Survey, um, we found that 21% of Rhode Island children aged three to five had untreated tooth decay. In comparison to the US population of this age group, 
25% under the federal poverty line had untreated tooth decay. However, for those over the federal poverty line, only 11% did, um, and all incomes 14%. Next slide. The third grade basic screening survey, which is a screening survey that we conduct at elementary schools across Rhode Island, um, this helps to show the racial and ethnic disparities that exist among third graders. Um, looking at this, you can see non-Hispanic whites had a lower rate of treated and untreated decay, but um, higher rates of sealants. Um, this survey is actively going on right now, and it was going on for the school year, but we had to halt due to the pandemic. Next slide. Um, so looking at teenagers um, in Rhode Island, you can see that the percentage of students that saw a dentist during the past 12 months for a checkup, teeth cleaning or other dental work varies among races. Um, black had the lowest at 56%, while white had 86. Next slide. So not only is good oral health important for your overall health, it's also important for your mental health. Um, through YRBS survey, um, mental health outcomes by oral health status showed that students that were sad or hopeless, seriously considered attempting suicide, made a plan about how they would attempt suicide, or actually attempted, all had higher rates of feeling self-conscious or embarrassed due to their teeth or mouth. Next slide. Um, and lastly, looking at disparities among Rhode Island seniors, um, we have seen that since 1991, the identicalist rate of seniors age 65 or older have been decreasing. This is due to many factors such as preventative care and change in dental practices. However, there's still a great disparity of edentulous rates among different racial groups. Our older adult basic screening survey found that black older adults were more than twice as likely to have to be edentulous than white older adults. Next slide. Um, and you can see that disparities exist at a US population as well, not just in Rhode Island. A higher percent of women are edentulous than men Non-Hispanic Black has the highest rate when compared to other racial groups. And Sam, back to you. The two key preventive measures that have been recognized as effective are community water fluoridation and dental sealants. Water fluoridation is a public health measure because it is available to all. We're fortunate both that past water directors had the public health mindset to initiate fluoridation and that we work effectively with the current staff at our water systems as partners. I actually learned from our oldest licensed dentist in the state, Dr. Joe Box, who's 95 years old, that the Providence water supply was directed in the 1950s by Philip Holton, whose son was a dentist. So we were very fortunate that their foresight. Um, we'll, we're also fortunate to have almost 85% of Rhode Islanders on public water system getting fluoridation. Um, our biggest challenge is that many uh, Rhode Islanders may not be getting the benefit of fluoridated tap water if they're not drinking it. So we need to work in our communities, which are um, majority new non-English speaking Rhode Islanders to encourage switching from sugar sweetened beverages to tap water. This is gonna require working closely with health equity zones. And as I'll mention later on with community health workers who can um, help educate within the community about the benefits of water fluoridation. Uh, the picture on the right shows the thin plastic coatings applied to the tiny grooves on the chewing surfaces of back teeth called dental sealants. Dental sealants have been shown to reduce the incidence of tooth decay in children up to 78%. We're fortunate to have CDC funding to our SEAL-RI program to bring sealants to schools. However, we now need to work closely with our partners um, around with, uh, during COVID-19 um, to figure out new ways to bring sealants during this time. Previously, though, our biggest problem has been getting consents for sealants. Um, and again, that's something that we can work within the HES and work with community health workers. Okay. So um, just some numbers. Uh, during from 2000 to 14, 2014 to 18, over 63,000 children were served by CLRI. Um, 19,000 were screened. Uh, 9,000 were eligible for a sealant. 
3,300 received at least one sealant. Uh, we work closely with the CDC to do a cost benefit analysis. And um, this represented 173.90 uh, of averted treatment costs per child. The point is, as you know, sealants work, but our greatest barrier is getting those consent signed. Um, we need to go that extra effort to identify why. And again, that extra effort is an example of a health equity approach, and we hope to work closely with the HESIs and work closely as well with our um, community health workers. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk, uh, turn it back to Sadie. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, I'm gonna talk just quickly about the perinatal and infant Oral Health Quality Improvement Project, also known as POKI, uh, affectionately called. Um, it was a four-year Health Resources and Services Administration grant, or HRSA, that ended in the summer of 2019. Over the course of the grant, Rhode Island focused on improving the number of preventive dental visits for pregnant women and improving the number of dental visits for very young children. We broke the work down into four areas, as you can see on the slide, and we wanted to be very targeted with our messaging and education. So that's why we broke them down in this way. Next slide. This slide is to demonstrate how widely accepted these recommendations are. The importance of the age one dental visit and good oral health during pregnancy have been supported by national organizations on both the medical and dental sides for pretty much decades, but both providers and patients are still hesitant. Next slide. This slide shows some of the activities that we worked on during the POKI grant. Um, the first is the creation of bilingual resources, which you can see on um, the far left. We combined two brochures into one to limit the amount of paper a pregnant woman gets at a doctor's visit. And we at used actual Rhode Islanders for the photos. We also added to and promoted more widely a flip book for teaching families more about oral health. These flipbooks had patient-facing information on one side and more detailed information for the provider on the other. Uh, these started as just for dental providers, but expanded to include family visitors and others. As you can see um, in the graph on the far right, by providing family visitors with the tools and trainings to feel comfortable talking about oral health, the amount of minutes spent talking about oral health with families increased exponentially. This includes the flipbooks. And then finally, in the middle, we created the Age One Dental Champion Directory based off requests from pretty much everyone that no one knew which dentist in Rhode Island would see very young children. This directory is completely voluntary and now has over 60 providers listed. Next slide. This slide shows some of the successes of our quality improvement projects. We worked with multiple, multiple federally qualified health centers and medical, medical offices to improve medical dental integration through the POKI project. The graph on the left shows the increase in pregnant patients who had a dental care visit at Thunder Mist Health Center. This was achieved through a new referral mechanism put in place between the medical and dental offices. The graph on the right shows the increase in overall oral health services provided by non-oral health providers. This was in large part due to a quality improvement project with multiple private medical offices to be trained on and then apply fluoride varnish in their offices. We had a dental hygienist consultant work with the sites and help them with technical assistance. Next slide. This slide shows that although we saw successes, we still have work to do. More education and outreach is needed to promote preventive dental visits during pregnancy especially with the Medicaid population, which you can see on the graph on the right-hand side, the blue, darker blue bar, I believe it's blue, might be purple, um, that shows the Medicaid population um, of those who had a dental visit during pregnancy. Next slide. This final slide shows what we consider a big success. Over the course of the grant, the number of dental visits for Medicaid recipients ages one to two increased from about 20% to over 30%. We need to keep the momentum going with the end of the grant to continue to see these numbers grow. And we are working on sustainability and next steps to continue funding. And I will hand it back to Sam. 
Actually, it's time for Jen. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Ritchie. I'm the Health Professions Experience Coordinator um, for the Oral Health Program. So another, Sam, can you go to the next slide? Sorry. Thank you. Um, another area that our oral health program is looking to promote equity in oral health is in our workforce. Um, so we've seen over the years that our dental professionals have really significantly dropped in the last um, 10 years, as, as you can see, um, where we have 30 to 69 dentists, um, age dentists, we have really dropped from the ages 22 to 29. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a comparison of the U.S. national rates and Rhode Island. So the last time we were close to the national rates was in 2001, um, and we've really stayed pretty far below the national average since then. Next slide. Um, this is also a really good breakdown of racial and ethnic diversity among dentists. Um, specifically, if you look at um, Black or African Americans and Hispanics, um, our numbers are significantly lower for dentists compared to the U.S. population. Next slide. So why is diversity important for health equity and what are we specifically doing in Rhode Island? Um, we have a goal at the Department of, at Rhode Island Department of Health for people to see and identify with their providers, specifically their dentists. Um, so that's something we really keep in mind when we're going out putting our efforts into the communities, making presentations, um, and facilitating in-office experiences. Next slide. So one way we are doing that is through our Health Professions Experience Program. Um, this is a HRSA grant that we received, and we were able to set up a 10-week shadowing program for high school students. So they are able to experience different healthcare careers that they may not have thought of or had the opportunity opportunity to explore before. Um, and one, we it is open to dentistry, radiology, nursing, pharmacy. There's a great, um, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for people, but we do specifically um, kind of push the dental more just because we, we need that in Rhode Island. So in 2019, we had 13 students in this program. And for 2020, we had 22 students that were ready to um, complete their rotations. Next slide. Um, so these are some of the locations specifically for dentists that we have. We had one socket dental associates. We had two private um, dentists, Dr. Picard and Dr. Ward. And then we also were able to get into our federal, federally qualified um, health center, which is Thundermist, who has a dental service program. Um, so they were able to get exposed to a, a good amount of um, opportunities for dental uh, careers. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Sam, I think. Okay. So lastly, let's, let me do this. Uh, oh, start video. So um, as, as we wind up, I, I'd also like to say that we had started last year doing training of community health workers. Community health workers also called frontline health workers. These are now licensed professionals in Rhode Island, many of whom work in federally qualified health centers. Um, we've worked closely with the Community Health Worker Association of Rhode Island, also called SHWARI, to put together, uh, last year we did a half day program and we adapted that from the Smiles for Life curriculum for frontline health workers, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's a series of at least four presentations, um, those presentations on treating the pregnant woman, treating the age one dental visit, an over, overarching view of dental health and working with older adults. Um, and so those presentations uh, include lectures. What's most impactful is the discussion groups. There's a film and people discuss the film. There's something called collective wisdom questions and it gives them the opportunity to work together. I won't share them with you now, but it, there are also scenarios that we go through to let people work on these issues. 
Um, finally, one example that's been very successful of one uh, community health worker did a rotation at a federally qualified health center to help them with dental case management. If you're not familiar, these are four fairly recent codes uh, from the American Dental Association um, addressing compliance barriers, care coordination, motivational interviewing, and education. And uh, through a uh, HRSA workforce grant and collaboration with uh, MISDA, the Medicaid uh, Services Dental Association, um, we developed training programs to teach about use of those dental case management codes. And one of our partners, Tri-County Health Center, had a community health worker who really took that on and demonstrated improvements in their uh, no-show rate. So that was an example of using a community health worker right in the health center to make a difference. So wrapping it up, I'd encourage you all to visit our website of the oral health program, health.ri.gov forward slash oral health. We'll have a lot of helpful information. And uh, I'm now going to uh, say thank you from all of us. Uh, and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll move on to the next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rock Island team. That is awesome. Um, so again, we're going to take on the questions at the end of both presentations. So please feel free to put the questions in the Q&A box. Um, now, I would like to welcome our next presenter, Dr. Um, Hafatu Diop. Uh, she will be presenting on the oral health journey in Massachusetts from data to action. Um, Dr. Diop is the director of the Office of Data Translation at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. She serves at the state maternal and child health, um, EBI, and the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System um, program director. So Dr. Diop, um, please take it away. Thank you. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity to share our work here in Massachusetts, our so-called oral health journey from data to action. Oops, can I advance my slides? Uh, I have no conflict of interest to disclose and I am not a dentist. Our goal today is to describe the work of the Title V program over the past decade to improve oral health care during pregnancy. Our second goal is to talk about PRAMS, Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, and how PRAM data were used to examine oral health care during pregnancy. And the third goal is to describe how population-based public health data can be leveraged to change clinical practice. This is our outline. I will review the importance of oral health care during pregnancy. I'll give a short overview of the Title V program in Massachusetts for those who aren't familiar with Title V. I'll talk a little bit about how we use the PRAMS data uh, to change um, practices in Massachusetts and then um, provide a little overview of the process we went through to develop and implement our oral health practice guidelines. So in 2000, which is 33 years ago, the Surgeon General stated that oral health is a silent epidemic affecting millions of Americans. During the same year when the HB 2010 goals were launched, they did include oral health. There were 28 focus areas and area 21 was entirely dedicated to uh, oral health. It called for minimized oral health disease through preventive services such as dental sealings. It also called for improving the oral health care system, including improving utilization and access to services, particularly for low-income children, and access to oral health services at the community health centers. And it also called for increasing state and federal support, such as expansion of dental programs, community water fluoridations, and development and implementation of state-based surveillance system. 
although there was increased awareness about the importance of oral health in the general population related to these three objectives, there was no reference to pregnant women. Ten years later, the Healthy People 2020 objectives were also released. And despite the growing awareness of the importance of oral health among pregnant women, there was still no mention of oral health among pregnant women. Yet, we know that oral health is key to overall health and well being. We also know that pregnancy is a unique period characterized by physiological changes which may affect oral health. These adverse outcomes include enamel erosions, dental caries, loose teeth, pregnancy oral tumors, gingivitis, and periodontitis. Poor oral health has been associated with poor pregnancy outcomes. However, preventive, diagnostic, and restorative dental treatment is safe throughout pregnancy and is effective in improving and maintaining oral health. This slide shows the proposed biological mechanism by which periodontal infection could increase the risk of preterm birth and low birth weight. Periodontal infection is a cause, is capable, it's caused by gram negative anaerobic bacteria, and these bacteria are capable of producing a variety of chemical inflammatory mediators such as prostaglandins, interleukins, and tumor necrosis factors that can directly affect the pregnancy. The individual host response, partially mediated by specific genotypes, also plays an important role as a determinant of disease expression. These chemicals are also the um, mediators, the chemicals you see when women are in labor and uh, when they're released in higher numbers, they can cause premature preterm birth. This slide shows four radiographs with uh, dental cavities. In full disclosure, um, the slides belong to a woman who is a good friend of mine, but I have permission to share this radiograph. As you can see, there are 12 cavities and there were filled over four dentist appointments. This was her first pregnancy. And uh, prior to pregnancy, she had no problems. She's highly educated. She's a physician. In fact, she's a neonatologist who worked in the Longwood area at Boston Children's Hospital. She, had, she was in good health, had good dental coverage, and her oral health still deteriorated during her pregnancy. So the question I asked back then in 2010 was, if this could happen to her, what happened to other women who are not as educated, don't have dental insurance, don't have access to dentists? Now, I'm gonna switch gears to talk about what we've done in Massachusetts to address um, oral healthcare during pregnancy. I'll give a brief overview of the Title V program in Massachusetts, just in case you're not familiar with Title V. It's a maternal child health program. It's the nation's oldest state and federal partnership. It was enacted in 1935 as part of the Social Security Act. The, role, the goal of Title V is to provide a foundation for ensuring the health of the nation's mothers, women, children, and youth, including children and youth with special health care needs and their families. Title V is funded by HRSA and as a requirement to receive Title V funds, states need to conduct a five-year needs assessment. States are also required to match every $4 of federal money by $3 of state or local money. In Massachusetts, we do significantly more. We match by $16. As a part of the needs assessment, we, which we're required to do every five years, we conduct, I wanna say that 
the, our last needs assessment was conducted in 2015. Prior to that, we had another needs assessment in 2010. The work I'm going to describe today is based on the needs assessment that was conducted in 2010. We are in the process of developing, working on our 2020 needs assessment, which will be submitted uh, this summer in July. As part of the needs assessment, we conduct extensive literature reviews. We looked at state, national data, including ERSSS, PAMS, the National Survey for Children's Health. We also conduct a lot of targeted um, surveys for the 2010 needs assessment. We conducted a youth survey, obtained 225 responses. We also reached out to 590 families with children and special health care needs. In addition, we have several key informant interviews, a total of 67, internal and external. We also conducted uh, 13 focus group reaching 140 individuals uh, across multiple diverse groups including LGBTQ, teen girls, boys, pregnant and parenting women, low income mothers, Spanish speaking, military families, families facing housing insecurity, youth, Spanish speaking parents, etc. In addition, we conducted several town halls. We went across the state to talk to communities. And this slide shows an example of a flyer that we had back in 2010. Um, we went to Bridgewater, we went to Holyoke, Needham, pretty much across the state to be sure that we were reaching all our communities. And the reason for that was to share with them what we had learned with our data and uh, to get their input on what the issues were, what they felt like should be addressed as priorities. One of the major data systems, population-based data system we used as a part of the needs assessment in 2010 was PRAMS, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, which is an ongoing surveillance system of states in partnership with CDC. PRAMS asks about the maternal attitude, behaviors, and experiences before, during, and shortly after pregnancy. Nationwide PRAMS was started in 1987 to reduce infant mortality rates and low birth weight. At the time, the rates of uh, infant death were no longer declining and CDC was uh, trying to create data system to allow further declines on the rates. So PRAMS allows to collect state specific data such as disability, prenatal care, satisfaction, social connectedness, postpartum depression, as well as race ethnicity. In Massachusetts, we did not begin PRAMS until 2007. And from the beginning, we recognized that there weren't enough data, there was no data related to pregnancy, oral health care during pregnancy. So we included those questions very early on. This map shows all the states and jurisdictions that are participating in PRAMS. There are 50 jurisdictions participating currently in PRAMS, which represents about 83% of all live births in the US. When we looked at our PRAMS data back in 2010, we found that only 65% of women who gave birth in our state reported having dental cleaning before pregnancy. And an even smaller percentage, 44%, reported getting dental cleaning during pregnancy. Now, these numbers were very low. We're only talking about dental cleaning, not even dental treatment. Then when we looked at the data by race ethnicity, as you can imagine, the minority groups, Black, Hispanic, and Asian, across the board had the lowest rates of dental cleaning, whether that was before or during pregnancy. However, Black non-Hispanic had the lowest rates of all groups. We also looked at the data 
by age and we found that younger ages less than 20 20 to 29 were less likely to receive dental cleaning compared to older women as we did more analysis additional analysis where we adjusted for co-founders such as age race education health insurance nativity we found that the factors, the characteristics that were associated with dental cleaning included for lower dental cleaning, Black, Asian, and other race, less than college education, non-US born, women who reported having a mistimed pregnancy, women at 200% or less federal poverty level, women with on public insurance, and women who reported having uh, life stressors greater than six. The factors that were associated with higher dental cleaning included age 30 to 39 or age 40 or older, Hispanic race, and women who reported multivitamin use. Now, as a part of the needs assessment, once we collect all the data and sensitize it, we usually come up with several priorities and in order to select the 10 that could only be included in the Title V uh, needs assessment, we used an evaluation criteria where we looked at what is the likely impact and what is the feasibility of success for the priorities. And we do this exercise after we've conducted our town halls where we receive the feedback from uh, the communities in addition to the data. And in 2010, oral health did make the cut where it was high feasibility and large impact. So these are the 10 priorities we selected um, in 2015 and 2020. Uh, oral health was a priority back in 2010, and we, again, in 2015, decided to select it based on all the criteria I described in the previous slide. And our priority, as you can see, was to promote equitable access to dental care and preventive services for pregnant women and children. Now, I'd like to talk about what we did since 2010 after we selected uh, oral health as a priority for pregnant women. We started out with presentations to medical schools, dental schools, and public health schools to talk about what we are seeing in the PRAMS data and encourage medical school to include oral health curriculums in their teaching. We also conducted a provider survey where we reached out to um, five different groups, dentists, hygienists, prenatal providers, PA, and family physicians. The findings from the survey, the 20, 2012 survey, were shared at a statewide oral health summit, which could be a whole presentation. I did not include those findings here, but essentially what we learned was that while all providers across the board agreed that oral health care was key to overall health and important to pregnancy, there was reluctance to provide care during pregnancy. The dentist did not feel comfortable caring for pregnant women. The prenatal providers did not feel comfortable examining women for oral health conditions and did not feel comfortable um, referring women to the dentist. So we realized that there was a need for more training. And we also learned that there was no recommendation, the perinatal care recommendation in Massachusetts, which is what the prenatal providers use when they examine patients in the office, did not include anything related to oral health. And in 2013, we applied for our first oral health grant, the Massachusetts Oral Health Linkage Grant. The primary goal of the grant was to strengthen the connections between oral health and primary care. 
we use the grant to address the state's most pressing oral health workforce needs and reduce disparities in access to oral health prevention and care. We targeted underserved urban and rural communities, low-income residents, migrant workers, homeless individuals, and pregnant women who are low income. And during the same year, we held our first oral health summit where we brought together prenatal providers and dental providers uh, to talk about the importance of oral health care during pregnancy. We also worked with the Massachusetts Health Quality Partners to include oral health care in the perinatal care recommendations. And this is what was included in 2013. It was a milestone for the first time oral health was being recommended as something that the prenatal provider should be doing. And it did say to ask for oral health studies, including oral health history in the last, in the last dental visit. It recommended that prenatal provider check the mouth for problems, including swollen or bleeding gums. It recommended to document oral health history and the studies in studies in the medical record. And then if the last dental visit took place more than six months ago, or if any oral health problem were identified, advised to schedule an appointment with a dentist. These recommendations are posted on our website. <laughs> Next, we decided to work on the development of oral health care guidelines. Back in 2011, when we started this work, there were only two states in the US with oral health care guidelines for pregnant women. California and New York, and we had learned as part of the survey that clinicians wanted uh, guidance. They wanted some tool, they didn't know what to do. So we decided that it was a time for us to develop our own guidelines. We started working with our medical and dental providers and the Mass Health Quality Partners, the Massachusetts Perinatal Quality Collaborative and our Medicaid program, Mass Health. We convened our first advisory committee, working group and steering committee. We learned from other, the other two states. We invited New York to come to talk at our summit. And this is what our uh, committee looked like. We had a steering committee, which provided overall direction and guidance and resources to engage stakeholders as appropriate. We also had the working group under the guidance of the steering committee the working group was in charge of drafting the actual guideline. And then the, at the bottom, we had the advisory committee, the large advisory committee provided clinical content expertise and was supposed to help us present the guidelines to their organizations for buy-in. Here is the cover of our guidelines, which were released in March of 2016. They can be found at the mass.gov uh, website. I would encourage all of you to um, look for them if you haven't seen them. They do contain a lot of good information for all types of providers, um, prenatal providers, dental providers, and pediatric providers. We received a national award for the development of the guidelines at the national MCH EPI conference. We received the effective practice at the state level award for the oral health steering committee, which was very um, encouraging. We conducted several presentations related to oral health at the Mass Perinatal Quality Collaborative Summit. These are the um, this is the, the statewide summit that attracts um, the prenatal providers across the state from all hospitals in Massachusetts. We also participated in the oral health interstitial curriculum, which was initiated by UMass and led by Dr. Hugh Silk. In 2016, we were invited to come to the school and present the guidelines to the students who were um, taking 
uh, electives and uh, they had an all day oral health day at the school. The goal was to educate medical students and graduate nursing students on the importance of oral health in the care of the individual patients. These trainings provided us with an opportunity to promote our guidelines. And uh, the Department of Public Health aims to expand these trainings beyond the UMass to other medical schools in the state. Now, in 2018, um, the perinatal care recommendations included, again, a bullet related to oral health. But as you can see, we went from a longer and extensive um, list of recommendations to just one bullet, ask about oral health, if the last dental visit took place more than six months ago. I personally felt like we needed to keep all the bullets to um, keep this important issue on uh, providers' radar. This was, from my perspective, a little shorter, but we are working again to uh, reiterate the importance of oral health with all our providers. The 2018 pediatric preventive care recommendations also included a section on oral health care during infancy and childhood. One of the other um, accomplishments for us was the inclusion of oral health questions on the birth certificate starting in 2008. And part of that was due to the fact that when we presented PRAMS data to the providers, they wanted to see the data by hospital. They were interested in seeing how they were doing as an institution which cannot be obtained uh, using PRAMS data. PRAMS data can be only presented at the state level. It's a population-based survey, and we can only generate data um, at the state level. So we decided to add the same questions we had on the PRAMS survey to the birth certificate and allow us to look at um, oral health by hospital. And we just collected uh, one year of data, 20, 18 and 2019, we are hoping that by 2021, we will have at least two years of data that we can present at the next um, Mass Perinatal Neonatal Quality Collaborative Summit, which is attended by the OBs. And then each hospital should be able to see how they're doing compared to the state or compared to the other hospitals. We found that to be very effective as hospitals are very competitive. They always want to feel like they're doing well and or better than their counterpart. So we're hoping to use uh, the data to create more action. Now, I want to show you the data from when we started in 2007 to where we are now in 2018. As you can see in this slide, the trends are going up slowly but surely with a 2%, approximately 2% annual percentage change uh, from 48%, 49% in 2000 to 58% in 2008. This is um, not where we want the data to be, but it's better because at least it's trending up, it's going the right way. And this slide shows all the factors that may have contributed to the increase in trend, starting with us selecting oral health as a priority for Title V in 2010, the national consensus statement, which was released in 2012, our summit, statewide summit in 2013, along with the release of the mass perinatal care recommendation the same year, and the same year was the year ACOG had uh, released its opinion, committee opinion, and uh, followed by our release of the payment and guidelines in 2016. All factors combined may have contributed to the increase we see now. We also wanted to look at the um, trends by race ethnicity. As you can see, for both black and white, the trends were going up. In fact, the annual percentage change for Black was higher 
than white, it increased by approximately 3% when it was only about 2% among whites. And when you look at the trends for Hispanic, the same, we see the same pattern. The trends were increasing even more among Hispanic at about 4% annual percentage change compared to 2% among white. Similar pattern with Asian women, trends were going up nicely at 3% APC, which was good to see. However, we recognize that while the trends are going up for all the minority groups, the gaps have remained the same. The inequities between black and white has not closed. And this is something we should keep working on because the goal is not just to change the trend, the direction of the change, but also to close the gap. When we shared our data with the medical community, uh, particularly the prenatal providers, what we heard was they weren't super interested in oral health because they wanted something that had evidence-based. They wanted um, um, to talk about issues that um, were backed up by research. They wanted to see, they wanted us to be able to say that oral health improved the pregnancy outcome because ultimately for them, uh, the key is improving uh, pregnancy outcomes. So we also did some research using our PRAMS data to look at dental cleaning, community water fluoridation, and preterm birth. And we found that uh, dental cleaning alone was protective uh, against preterm birth and a combination of both fluoridation and dental cleaning were also um, associated with decreased preterm birth. And this paper was published in 2018. Here I wanted to show um, our fluoridation status. As you can see, there are still a lot of blank uh, spots, which means that we really have a lot more work to do. Uh, we heard from Rhode Island about the importance of the fluoridation. Uh, but again, in Massachusetts, we still have a long way to go to accomplish that. For our next steps, we are planning on continuing to disseminate the guidelines. They are currently about four years old, and it is time to update the guidelines with new data and new research that may have come up. We are also planning on supporting the community health centers and providers that are willing to implement the guidelines. We will continue to analyze our data by hospital and use hospital data as a quality improvement framework to uh, improve outcome. We will seek for additional funding to support provider training. It seems like there is a need for more training among our uh, providers when it comes to oral health. And that was my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dayov. Um, and again, thank you so much, Sadie, Jody, Jennifer, and Dr. Uh, um, what I'm going to open now for um, questions and answers. So for those who have not, um, uh, who could like, feel free to add more questions in the Q&A. Um, at this time, I have some uh, of the questions um, that I'm going to read to the team with the hope that we all can answer. Um, so one question is from uh, Nita, seeing this data, why is it too high rate in our Latino and African American without teeth once they go um, and receive dental care? Dentists are removing more teeth than trying to save them. So why is that that they go for the faster asset and start to removing um, all extractions, leaving the young people without denture? So uh, this is Sam. I, I saw that question that I, I might have, oh, let's see. Yeah, hi, this is Sam. So the question was, um, why are people getting teeth removed and may may or not be getting dentures. I mean, I think there, there are a couple of factors. I think number one, oftentimes by the time people are reaching our health centers, their teeth are in, they might be in a poor condition that um, extraction might be one of the only options 
The other thing is that some of our Medicaid programs, um, as, as many of us know, adult uh, Medicaid is, um, is optional. It's not mandatory. Children's uh, coverage of dental is mandatory. Adult is still optional. And then the states can determine what is covered. And in most cases, um, if a tooth has reached a point where it's pulpally and you know, the pulp of the tooth is involved, a root canal may not be covered. I know in Rhode Island, the Medicaid program covers root canals for anterior teeth only, not for posterior teeth. So it becomes, uh, treatment planning becomes um, difficult. And that might be a reason why extraction is an option and then um, dentures. I can also tell you states vary in terms of what they cover for dentures. So um, we, we need to adapt in Rhode Island to cover immediate dentures, which actually are a sort of a kinder way to allow um, the teeth to be removed and dentures to be placed the same day. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my, my attempt. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Zeckenbaum. Um, the second coming from Salini is, are there any methods that SEAL Rhode Island program has adopted to increase the parental consent forms and dental participation rates? Sadie, do you want to take that one about some of the work we've tried to do? Um, I'm so sorry. Would you mind repeating that? I had someone come into my office. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sure. Um, the question is, um, are there any methods that SEAL Rhode Island program has adopted to increase the parental consent forms and dental participation rates? Yes. So we have actually learned from some other um, states and cities in particular, um, one of them being Chicago, who implemented a, um, a wristband protocol, which um, they were kind of like the Livestrong bracelets that um, kids would have um, given to them, and they could wear them home to remind the parents to sign the consent forms. So we did something um, a little bit cheaper <laughs> um, based on our budget, um, which was more like a um, a wristband that you get when you go into a concert um, and they were given out at certain schools um, to be sent home as kind of a quality improvement project to see if it worked in our in our schools and we did see a little bit of an improvement um, in the return of consent forms so that's one thing we did um, another thing we did we have a, a back to school program that happens usually um, at the end mid to end of August, right before school starts. And the Department of Health and the federally qualified health centers who participate in CLRI, we all went to the different areas where backpacks would be given out and tried to have the parents that were there sign the consent forms while they were getting the backpacks. Um, so that actually was a um, big success because we had the forms right there. We were able to explain to parents the, um, what CLRI was and what sealants were, um, they were able to sign right there on the dotted line. Um, so those are two examples of the way we've tried to improve the, the return rate for consent forms. And sorry again about that. <laughs> no worry. Thank you so much, Sadie. Um, and I saw a couple of other questions in the Q&A and it's got answers already. However, I would like to open um, out so that um, we can um, say it again to the uh, audience here. So what are the ways that we are thinking to bring Sealand back into the schools in the middle of COVID? So, so yeah, I, I tried to answer that one. Again, I, I would say this, this is gonna be a challenging one, number one, because of the PPE that uh, we expect will be needed more greatly. Uh, I know that if, if folks look on the web and perhaps we can share it, that I think in a couple of weeks, uh, NOAA will be having a presentation about this. One of the thoughts is to move from a uh, acid etch uh, resin technique to a glass ionomer technique, which will require less aerosol but we're still wondering what schools are gonna, to what extent schools will let us in. So there's still a lot of concern, a lot of uh, worry. One of the things we do know in Rhode Island is probably in the fall, the high schools are likely to continue um, doing their um, schools online. 
but since online training has not worked as well for elementary schools, it's likely that the elementary schools will be going back to school, which is fortunately that's our target age group, which we hope to resume both our basic screening survey and our sealant program. But I'd, I'd encourage everybody to look out for a presentation. I think it's NOAA or one of the other groups regarding sealants. Great. Thank you so much, um, doctors. And then um, another question to you could be, um, I know that you already answered this, Dr. Um, Zeckenbaum, but if you can also say that again, um, the questions could be, uh, do you get Part B HRSA or help funding? And are you going to use an it for dental care for persons living with HIV? So, so we do not get that funding through our oral health program, but several of our, I believe several of our health center partners do. Uh, I know Ryan White funds are managed um, through uh, the Rhode Island AIDS Action uh, Group working with Delta Dental with the goal of making um, the insurance just like every other Delta Dental so there's no um, preconceived um, uh, you know, discrimination when somebody sees a certain type of insurance. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I need to find out more about that, Helene. Sorry. Great, thank you. Um, and I think another question that also get answers here, but um, um, Teresa asked, um, just a bit curious, um, the original picture with the three children looking over the fence were people of color. Uh, why were they compelled to change the race of the children when discussing equity? I believe this is one of the slide in the Rhode Island team presentation. Yeah, and I think whoever answered that one answered it well. I, I don't remember what the answer was. But yeah, we've all seen that slide and I, I don't have any further comment. But I think the, the goal of the slide is to represent that, um, that equity requires those extra efforts to, to um, help communities where there is inequity. So measures such as bringing in community health workers at, at our health centers, um, working uh, very closely with the HESES and funding those uh, health equity zones to have outcomes that get community input, I think are critical. So a lot of, a lot of money has helped with um, those HESES and that's an example of putting in extra dollars to get the community input. Great, thank you so much, Sam. Um, Rodrigo, I saw that you answered that question. Do you have anything else to add into that um, question? If you can um, please unmute yourself if you have um, anything else to add. This might be, he must be locked here already. So anyone else has any other questions that we can um, that our presenter here can respond. So on, I, this is Sadie. I just want to add to that. If anyone would like to see our, um, our flip book or any of the brochures, anything I referred to during our presentation, I forgot to mention that I'm happy to share it. They can um, reach out to me at any time. That would be great, Sadie. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Is it possible if you can send the link to us and then we can share with all the participants later? Yes, I believe there's a PDF version of the flipbook that I can send. Awesome, great, thank you. So I think just a couple of notes from um, Helena who um, asked this question. Oh no, um, just a comment on that could be just a matter of equity. So that's why he, uh, she brought this up not for any other reason. And the other one could be responding back to this could be, um, yeah, I suppose that it depends on what message you are trying to debit, but why uh, whites don't experience disparities, um, yet people of color do. A correct depiction for white children could be that their box could be tall and that at the same level. Uh, thank you, Teresa, for that um, feedback. Yeah, anyone else has any? I just, put the, I just put the link 
to the NOAA webinar of dental sealants in a COVID world into the chat. Thank you so much, Sam. You bet. Yes, so, so for audience, um, you know that you can save the chat here if needed to be um, by just hovering on the um, three dots on your right side and uh, click save to that. All right, anyone else has any other question? I just wanna say what a pleasure this has been and um, don't forget the beautiful pictures you saw in Rhode Island. And I'd encourage everybody from Massachusetts to come and visit us. And um, what, when we can cross the boundaries uh, to enjoy our lovely state, we, we love visiting Massachusetts as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, um, uh, Rhode Island team, for joining us for this um, virtual oral health summit. Um, it's, re it's really enriching our content here today, too. So if nobody have any questions, um, I think we might uh, also close our um, session today. So before closing, I would like to thank you everyone again, um, all the speakers, great presentation, on participation, uh, on the participants who spend the Friday um, listening in and also ask questions. So don't forget to attend our last session, which would be on Friday, June 12, starting at 11 a.m. as well. And that could be our last um, series in the session. So uh, don't forget to fill, um, to fill in to complete your evaluations, which you would expect it to receive after um, this um, session's ending as well. Uh, thank you so, so much, everybody, and have a great Friday afternoon.